A Tale of Two Sides, a novel on vaccines and disease by John Philip Ryan. Chapter 1, Nurses Know Best, a chapter about hepatitis B vaccine. Push. Good. Now breathe. That's it. Deep breaths. Now give me your hand. Paulina felt her contraction subside as Dr. Goodman gently guided her hand down past her abdomen and, Is that? Paulina asked. Yes, my dear, that's his head. This was Paulina and Ruben's first baby. So far the labor was about what she'd expected, except for the pain. Ugh, no one warned me about that. But isn't it almost over now? She wondered through the mixed haze of pain, work, and joy. And Dr. Goodman is so wonderful, the best OB in town, she thought. So glad we picked her, she's so warm, understanding, and confident. Reuben, on the other hand, doesn't look so good, thought Paulina, glancing up at her husband. Oh, please, don't faint, not now. Men, I can't believe I have to worry about him while I'm right in the middle of, oh, dear God. The next contraction hit hard. Paulina tuned everything out again except for Dr. Goodman's gentle, reassuring voice. Push. Now breathe. Push. Now don't push. Relax. Paulina was focused and followed every suggestion and... Wah! The most joyful sound in the world. Paulina felt the warm, slimy, squirming body on her chest. She wrapped her arms gently around this little bundle of joy, who instantly became her entire universe. Now all was right in the world. Juliana loved being a nurse. All those years of training were hard, but well worth it. She wasn't so thrilled with having to work, labor, and delivery over the past year, but you take what you can get was her motto. She didn't have any kids yet, and this year had really done nothing to convince her she'd ever be able to go through what each of her patients had to endure. She glanced across the labor and delivery room at the new mom and dad, both gazing at their one-hour-old baby, now sleeping in mom's arms. They look happy, especially the mom. What was her name again? Juliana checked the chart on the counter. Gonzalez. Paulina Gonzalez, that's right. Catchy name, she thought as she prepared the vitamin K shot and the hepatitis B vaccine baby Gonzalez would need in the next few minutes. Juliana glanced around for the consent forms to make sure the parents had given their permission for the shots. There it is, and of course it's not signed. She rolled her eyes. I hope these Gonzaleses aren't the type of parents who think they know what's best for their baby. Jeez. Compliant parents were what Juliana loved most about her job, and in labor and delivery, most parents listened to her. She was a nurse, after all. She knew way more about medicine than any of them. She had a checklist of medical procedures that saved lives, and anyone who said no to something on her checklist not only put their lives in danger, but caused her way more hassle and paperwork. It's hard enough doing all the proper charting on a patient as it is. Juliana picked up the two syringes and headed over to the family, making sure her best smile was showing. She'd worry about the consent forms later. She watched the new dad obediently move out of the way as she neared. Now he's going to be a good father, she thought. He already knows what he's doing. Time to give the baby his vitamin K shot and his first vaccine, announced Juliana, watching both parents for any telltale signs of the look that would warn her they'd require some extra convincing. We want to delay the vitamin shot until we ask our pediatrician about it, said Paulina. She's surprisingly alert, thought Juliana. After all that arduous labor, most moms are so out of it that I can usually get the shots in before they even know it. But we don't want the hepatitis B vaccine, said the patient. Here we go, Juliana almost said out loud. Instead, making sure to keep smiling, she offered, Your baby really needs this vaccine to save his life. It's important. Don't you want your baby to be protected? Why does my baby need to be protected from hepatitis B? 
How exactly do you think he's going to catch it? challenged Paulina. You never know, Juliana replied. Plus the doctor ordered it and it's hospital policy and it's mandatory, you know. Plus, I'll have to walk all the way down to the nurse's station an extra time to grab the refusal of medical care forms, she added to herself. She liked to call these forms the bad parent forms. Maybe we should just do it, caved good patient Reuben. It's only one shot. No, Reuben, Paulina answered calmly, her arms reflexively pulling her baby closer to her chest. We talked about this. There's risk to this vaccine with absolutely no benefits since he's only a baby. It's for an STD, for God's sake. Don't you remember reading about this? Juliana watched the confident and loving way her patient looked at her husband and knew she had her work cut out for her. This mom wouldn't be an easy sell. Paulina knew her husband agreed with her, but he often found it hard to stand up to medical authorities. Good thing I don't, she thought. And it's nice that Dr. Goodman wasn't too pushy about the vaccines she wanted me to have during pregnancy either. Maybe she'll help me get this nurse off my back before she leaves. Dr. Goodman, what do you think, she asked. Does our baby need a hepatitis B vaccine? Well, the doctor temporized looking at the nurse holding the shots and then back at her patient. You know, I do recommend all vaccines. Didn't you get the Tdap and the flu shot in my office during one of your prenatal visits? No, you let me skip those shots. But yeah, I know you have a lot of patients and I wouldn't expect you to remember that. But I was concerned about getting any shots during pregnancy because there wasn't enough safety research on them. You always told me to be very careful about what goes into my body during pregnancy, like the mercury and the flu shot. I know you didn't exactly agree with my decision, but you agreed it was my decision. Oh yes, I remember. You know, I never could find any published safety research on the flu and the Tdap vaccines, except for a very few small studies in pregnancy. And there was even one study showing a possible link between the flu vaccine and miscarriage. But now that they are giving these vaccines to every pregnant woman, they'll have proof it's safe pretty soon, I'm sure. As for the baby shots, you'll probably have to ask the pediatrician. It's a little out of my area. But if it's recommended, it must be very important. Otherwise, why would it be recommended? Oh, and that reminds me. I have to check on your rubella immunity test. I forgot if you were immune. You might need a rubella booster. I gotta run, though. I'll check in on you tomorrow. Paulina let Dr. Goodman go, but she was already leery about getting a rubella booster shot, even if she needed one. She turned back to the nurse. You said the Hep B vaccine is mandatory. What exactly do you mean by that? Paulina knew that it wasn't, but was curious what the nurse would say. Um, well, your baby won't be able to go to school without it. Plus, this vaccine prevents cancer. It will save his life. Well, school is a long way off, and I can teach my child how to prevent hepatitis B when the time comes, said Paulina. Right, Reuben? Yes, you're right, he answered. We'll skip the shot for now. Paulina sighed as she watched the nurse leave the room, shaking her head. She was used to that. It seemed to happen a lot to her whenever she went to the doctor, and now that she was making medical decisions for her baby as well, she suspected this nurse wouldn't be the last medical professional to shake a head at her. Well, if they don't want the shot, that's their choice. Just have them sign the refusal form and move on, instructed Joanna, Juliana's charge nurse. You can't force them, you know. Joanna liked being in charge of labor and delivery. Much of a labor nurse's job was guiding parents through various medical decisions and the newborn hepatitis B vaccine was just one of them. Joanna had never really understood why they gave that shot to newborns, so she was okay when parents said no. Most of the nurses on the floor were. Medicine requires informed consent, and if parents want to opt out of an STD vaccine for the newborn, that was fine with Joanna and most of her colleagues. But there was something about Juliana that Joanna found odd. 
an unusual obsession with policy and procedure. Joanna suspected the nurse wasn't always following the rules, and she kept her eyes on her to make sure she didn't cross any lines, and proper consent documentation was one of the most important. Fine, Juliana grabbed the refusal form and headed back down the hallway. Bath time, announced Juliana as she paraded back into the Gonzalez's room, the unsigned refusal form stowed away in her back pocket, along with the hopefully soon-to-be-used hepatitis B shot. I'm going to take Baby to the nursery for his first bath. That way you two can get some rest. You look exhausted. Always remind them that you're doing them a favor, she reflected. Works every time. It didn't. Oh, we don't want him to have a bath yet, responded Mrs. Gonzalez. Tell her why, Reuben. Um, yeah, the baby's supposed to keep the vernix and all the natural bacteria from the birth on his skin to help his immune system get off to a good start. Paulina had an annoyingly satisfied look on her face, and Juliana suspected this man was just reciting what this woman had put into his brain. Seriously? thought Juliana. She had heard that one before and had no idea where such nonsense came from. If it were even remotely true, she would have learned it in nursing school. Everyone knows you are supposed to sterilize a baby with antiseptic soap as soon as possible. A sterile baby is a healthy baby, after all. Well, I have more cards to play. Okay, I'll just take baby to the nursery to check him out there. Gotta make sure he's healthy. Nope, answered mom. I thought this hospital had a rooming in policy. The baby can stay right here with us while you check him out. Well, we need to do his hearing test then. That has to be done in the nursery. Don't you wait until he's 24 hours old to do that? I thought I read that in the hospital prenatal brochure, chimed in dad. Jeez, whose side is he on anyway? Juliana didn't realize she was rolling her eyes for real now. What, do these parents think they know everything? Juliana left. Her shift was almost over anyway. If these parents want their baby to get an STD, that's their business. It would serve them right. Paulina awoke the next morning to a commotion in the hallway. She heard a man's voice asking questions and the sound of a woman crying. She glanced at her baby sleeping in the hospital bassinet and at her husband sleeping in the chair. Of course, he'll sleep through anything. Curious, she got up and peeked outside the door in time to see a baby being wheeled down the hallway in an incubator. She assumed the woman crying in the doorway next to hers was the baby's mother. What's the matter? Paulina asked, putting her hand gently on the other's shoulder. Is that your baby? Yes, the other sobbed. She has a fever and they are taking her to the NICU for treatment and observation. I don't get it. I had a fast labor. I don't have vaginal strep. Everything was fine yesterday. Why would my baby suddenly get a fever? Paulina had a sinking feeling she knew the answer. She had read in the FDA's vaccine package insert for the Hep B vaccine that between 1 and 10% of kids get a fever from the vaccine. But of course it might not be that, she thought. Maybe the baby does have a real infection after all. I wanted Sage's life to start out right, the mom continued. She was nursing well and we were just getting ready to go home. She just passed her hearing test with flying colors and went to the nursery for her first bath so she'd be healthy. An hour later, when they brought her back to me, she was lethargic and burning up. What the hell happened? Paulina didn't have the heart to tell this woman what may have happened. She suddenly felt like she needed to get herself and her baby out of here as quickly as she could and screw the hearing test. Another one in the NICU, sighed Dr. Goodman. That's the third baby this month. I don't get it. Marissa Goodman liked eating lunch with Peter Tommaso, one of the local pediatricians who still came into the hospital to see his newborn babies. Marissa was the current head of OB, and she liked to pick Peter's brain from time to time about what was going on in the world of newborn medicine. 
How many of your febrile babies actually end up having a positive sepsis workup? Peter asked. Or do they all just end up getting the usual 48 hours of IV antibiotics and intensive care, then go home? I haven't had a baby with a real infection here in years, Marissa answered. I guess that's a good thing, but I sure wish I knew why so many seemingly healthy newborns are getting these fevers. What about you? Are you seeing a lot of rule-out sepsis cases in your patients? Nope, I can't say that I have. I think the last one I had was about five years ago. But most of my patients tend to be the home birthers anyway. I only have one or two each month who are born here at the hospital these days. No offense to you and your profession, Peter smiled, holding up his hands. Marissa laughed. None taken. You know, I support home births, although I do think it's much safer to deliver in hospital. So, you really aren't seeing many fevers, huh? Maybe it's all that granola your patients eat. It was Peter's turn to laugh. <laughs> no offense taken either, unless you are trying to imply there's something wrong with granola. They both laughed and earned a few stares from the surrounding patrons in the hospital cafeteria. But seriously, I get all the naturally minded patients. They usually don't stay very long in the hospital, although that still doesn't explain why they aren't getting fevers. Marissa wondered if she should ask him about what was really bothering her, but wasn't sure she wanted to open herself up to any professional criticism. Although, from what she knew of Peter, if there was any pediatrician she could ask about this, it was him. Okay, Dr. Goodman, spit it out. I can tell something's bothering you. You have that look. Do you know if the... She lowered her voice and glanced around. The hepatitis B vaccine can cause fevers? Peter knew the answer to that. In fact, he'd known the answer for many years. The risk of fever was one of the reasons he stopped giving his newborn patients this vaccine years ago, despite the CDC recommendation that all newborns need it. That and the fact that babies don't catch sexually transmitted infections. He kept quiet about it over the years, but was recently rethinking that stance. And he liked having an OB like Marissa around. Yeah, she is pretty mainstream, but at least she welcomes patients who want a more natural approach to their OB care. She's young enough to know she doesn't know everything yet. She's teachable. But like all good doctors, she needs data, research, you know, proof that makes something right. Well, yes, it can cause fevers. It says right in the vaccine's package insert that between 1 and 10% of people will get a fever from the vaccine. And there's an interesting study published in 1999 from Israel that shows the year they started giving all their newborns the Hep B vaccine as recommended, their NICU admissions for fever doubled without any increase in actual newborn infections. What? Seriously? Marissa was shocked. If that's true, and based on my experience, I'm beginning to believe it, why do we give that vaccine to newborns? Why not wait until they're a few months old or even a few years old? Hell, why not just wait until they're teenagers? That would make way too much sense, Marissa. Since when did you start expecting a government-based medical policy to be made based on logic and common sense? I was already practicing back in the early 90s when this all went down, and it's quite a story. Got a few more minutes? Marissa glanced at her phone. Yes, I don't start back in the office for another half hour. Good, okay. So, the Hep B vaccine was created back in the 80s. It was targeted at those who were at high risk of catching Hep B, sexually promiscuous adults and IV drug abusers. But, no surprise, they couldn't get these patients to line up for their shots. They also gave the shot to any newborns who were born to a happy positive mom, which makes sense, right? Right? Well, that's where the logic of this vaccine ended, in my opinion. I wonder if people were pissed because they'd invested hundreds of millions of dollars to develop a vaccine that very few Americans were signing up for. Less than 1% of moms are happy positive, and no one really makes any money vaccinating only 1% of the country. So... Two of the doctors who worked with the pharmaceutical companies teamed up with a few colleagues and published research that showed about 30,000 American infants were mysteriously catching Hep B every year. What's up with the air quotes around the word showed and around mysteriously, asked Marissa. 
Well, there's no real evidence that that many kids were actually catching the disease. The easiest way to find out would have been to do a simple blood test on tens of thousands of kids and see the rate of hep B. But I think that they didn't think that would work because what would happen if they didn't find any hep B, which is what I suspect they would have found if they did a straightforward analysis like that. So the way I see it, they decided to do the study backwards. Start with adults who were infected and work back to try to figure out when in their lives they became infected. They had data on the number of adult Americans who were chronic hep B carriers at the time. It was about 1.25 million people. Epidemiological analysis showed that in order to have that many chronic carriers, there had to be about 200,000 people catching new cases every year. So they interviewed a bunch of adults with hep B to figure out how and when they may have caught it. And they found that about one third of adults didn't seem to have engaged in any high-risk behaviors, ever. The researchers concluded that about one-third of chronic adult hep B carriers may be, in air quotes again, contracting the disease during childhood. That may be is the key. It's not a lie, because it may be true. You see that a lot in medical research, but then somehow a maybe turns into probably, and then it becomes a fact. They did a little more fancy math and published some estimates showing that as many as 30,000 American children were catching Hep B every year through non-sexual contact. As many as is another way to blur a statistic. As many as could mean as little as just one or as many as 30,000. Anyway, doctors and policymakers convinced themselves that if 30,000 American kids were catching Hep B non-sexually every year, it must be occurring either at birth or through casual contact during childhood. And these kids needed saving, and the best way to save them would be to give the Hep B vaccine to every single newborn in America. You create a generation who will be immune, which sounds like a good idea, if the vaccine was harmless. But as you can see, it isn't. Here, I'll text you the research. I keep it handy on my phone for times like this when I have a rapt audience who will need to read it for themselves later. A link to three research articles showed up on Marissa's phone. Peter paused to let all this sink in. Marissa sat quietly trying to process it. Okay, I have a million questions. First, Hep B isn't a fun disease, right? God no, agreed Peter, especially when kids catch it. Sadly, if a baby catches Hep B from his mom during birth, he has about a 90% chance of becoming chronically infected if left untreated. About 25% of those will go on to liver failure or liver cancer. It's not a pretty disease. Glad I've never seen any cases in my 30 years of pediatrics. Fortunately, older kids who are accidentally exposed to it only have a 10% chance of chronic infection. And for adults, 95% of cases pass within a month or two without any lasting harm or chronic infection. Most healthy adult immune systems kill off the disease. For the 5% who do stay chronically infected, about one-third of those will be cured with a chemotherapy-type medication. So the fact that it is worse when babies catch it may have been a factor in getting the vaccine approved for all babies. They kind of just ignored the fact that babies don't catch it. Marissa rolled her eyes. That wasn't directed at you, Peter. It was aimed at whoever they are. Second question. Why did anyone believe this research, and didn't it bother anyone that two of the doctors who were involved in this research had previously done work for the vaccine makers? Peter just raised one eyebrow at his friend and waited. Oh, stupid question, Marissa answered herself. No one in the medical community reads entire research studies. They only read the summary, so all they would see is, quotes, 30,000 American infants are catching Hep B each year and freak out. And I imagine the pharma doctors had to disclose their ties to those companies, but no one really cares when that happens anymore, right? Correct. It's right there in the author section of these studies. They have to disclose it, but yes, no one cares. 
Next question. How do you know that 30,000 children are not catching hep B every year through non-sexual contact? Marissa put a challenging look on her face. Well, let's see what the CDC says about how hep B is transmitted. This will take me about 30 seconds. Peter typed CDC hepatitis B transmission into the Google search on his phone, clicked on the first choice, then clicked on the words transmission, symptoms, and treatment link under Q&A for healthcare professionals. Here, read this, he said. Marissa took the phone and read all the ways Hep B was transmitted, then read how it was not transmitted. HBV is not spread through food or water, sharing eating utensils, breastfeeding, hugging, kissing, hand-holding, coughing, or sneezing. So how do they think children are passing the disease to each other? That's a good question, complimented Peter. And the answer is they are not. Not passing it to each other, that is. Weren't there any real data on Hep B in children before they recommended the vaccine? Yes, I'll send you that study too so you can read it later. Peter's phone chirped and Marissa's chimed acceptance. They were only finding about one infant case for every 100,000 children, or about 360 cases each year. These cases were virtually all kids who caught the disease at birth from an infected mom who didn't know she was infected because she didn't get prenatal screening. But that's nowhere near 30,000, Marissa protested. Yeah, but it is somewhere between 1 and 30,000, or, quotes, as many as 30,000. So they aren't technically lying. But I still don't understand how this vaccine made it through the CDC's approval process to be put on the schedule for all babies. Why not just focus on universal screening for all pregnant moms and vaccinate all the babies whose moms are happy positive? Well, first, I don't know if they even looked at the real disease data to see how rare this disease really was in babies. I wasn't there, so I don't know. But it's my opinion that they may have had some unintentional bias towards studies that supported their agenda. And another reason this vaccine got approved is that some of the doctors who sat on the CDC's vaccine approval board back in the 90s had a financial stake in the success of vaccines. They were working for or they had stock in or had previously done work for the pharmaceutical companies who made the vaccines. I suppose you're going to text me proof of that as well, smiled Marissa, right before her phone chimed and Peter smiled. The U.S. government investigated the FDA and CDC vaccine approval boards in 2000 and reprimanded them for allowing such conflicts of interest and told them to start following the ethical rules that are in place to avoid such conflicts. And did they? Start following the rules, that is? Nope. In 2007, they were investigated again and reprimanded because 64% of the doctors serving on the CDC's ACIP vaccine approval board had financial conflicts of interest with vaccine manufacturers that should have banned them from taking part in the vaccine approval process, but some took part anyway. Didn't anyone get in trouble over this? asked Marissa. How would anyone get in trouble? The government tells the CDC to follow the rules, and the CDC, which is also the government, says okay, but then no one enforces the rules. How do you even know all this? wondered Marissa. Welcome to my life, sighed Peter. Think carefully whether or not you want to become a part of it. A chime alert startled the computer operator out of his reverie. Or had he actually been asleep? He wasn't sure. He read the words on his screen. Miss Donahue, Tony sent over a threshold alert from a small community hospital in, let me see, Washington State. What factor? asked his boss. Looks like hepatitis B vaccine again. Francine Donahue walked over and stood behind Jim so she could read it for herself. Hmm, looks like a negative acceptance rate of 8% now. Give me some background data. Jim clicked a few buttons and they both read what came up. Steady newborn hepatitis B vaccination rate of 96% for many years, mused Francine. Lower than usual, but steady. 
Someone there doesn't like this vaccine, but why the sudden alert? They kept reading. There it is, pointed out Jim Remington, trying to appear useful to his boss. A sudden drop from 96% to 92% in only one month. Someone else doesn't like that vaccine now either. Well, I'd like a statewide report on this before end of day. I doubt just one community hospital will hurt uptake by more than 0.01% statewide. And as long as we don't fall below 95% for Washington State, we'll keep the guys upstairs happy. Which makes me happy, which in turn lets you keep your job, Jimbo. Jim didn't mind the brief shoulder rub that accompanied his boss's encouragement slash threat. Yeah, she is quite a bit older than me, but what does that matter? He was just glad there were vaccines for STDs these days. Jeez, where would we be without them? Resources for all articles and studies mentioned in this chapter are available at johnphiliprion.com. A Tale of Two Sides is available for purchase on Amazon. Look for the author's own seller's page, and they are also available on johnphiliprion.com.